Dokshara. A vent on the ceiling blasted cool air over me as I shifted to a more comfortable position on the padded chair. Dr. Eric Shane was typing away on his keyboard, filling the air with a pleasing background noise. Up until this point, my mind had been a jumbled knot of disjointed emotions with no clear start or end to work through. Seeing that scene again, without the shock factor or looming threat of danger above me, was a completely different experience. Devastation was replaced with rage and panic was substituted with anticipation. I found a new point of view from which to observe this knot in my head, and a new set of tools to tug and prod the cords with. The doctor spun around on his chair to face me and quietly clapped his hands together. The organic parts of his face curled up into a warm smile, with creases in his skin indicating his age. He spoke with a unique accent, slightly rolling his R's and cutting his vowels short. And with that, Dokura, you have been mentally cleared and given a guest status. The live records of your emotional responses prove that you aren't mentally unstable, nor do you pose an immediate threat to yourself or those around you when unprovoked. How do you feel right now? Hot. Mmm, that's normal for your first time. Let me know if it lasts longer than ten minutes. He grabbed the terminal he was working, which was attached to the wall via a jointed mechanical arm, and pulled it over so he could both talk to me and view the screen at the same time. The recording of your dream just finished processing. I'm going to look through it once so I can better understand what you are feeling, and then we'll work through the footage together piece by piece. We can stop at any time you feel like it. No questions asked. My knee-jerk reaction was to call out and tell him to avoid that video at all costs. Its contents were an assault on one's sanity. I didn't want the kind doctor, who had shown nothing but a genuine willingness to help me, to suffer through the same thing I did. But I was still sluggish, and taking action was the last thing my body wanted to do before the heat passed. That moment of inactivity led me to have second thoughts. Why should I keep it hidden? As far as I'm aware, that's the only recording of what happened in that facility. I'm already a man without a cause. Is there any point in holding on to any secrets I've amassed over the years? Yeah. I should be exposing those freaks for everything they ever did. I should make them fucking pay for ruining my life. I have solid factual proof in my hands, and the possible backing of humanity, a rising star in this rotten and decrepit stage. If humans are so pretentious with their war rules and meddling tendencies, surely they would support me to an extent. Huh, <laughs> my own little crusade. Dr. Shane had already started watching the video. The warmth from his face is gone, replaced by cold calculation. His eyes contracted and dilated while he studied the footage, taking on a professional demeanor so as not to show his reaction of horror. His facade wasn't perfect. He slightly fidgeted with his hands and twitched his eyes as the video played. I could see the gears turning inside his head. He started to understand that the scope of this situation was far beyond him, and that he would need to pass this up the chain of command. He realized that he may need to breach his contract of confidentiality if I didn't agree with doing so myself, and that his reputation as a therapist may come under scrutiny in doing so. No need to worry, Dr. Shane. I'll make this easy for you. Captain Nathaniel Brand. I sank back into my seat in the command room and spent a moment recollecting my thoughts. My already busy schedule had just doubled in density now that preparations for a supply line and war were on the table. Governor Sindh had taken on a massive chunk of the work for the time being with her offer of a planet-wide industry shift, but that tactic wasn't sustainable on debt, and prolonged continuation would result in an economic crash. It was only a band-aid solution. There was also the actual issue of getting the supplies from the Nematorium Sociality over to us. Owl had managed to squeeze through detection by Gretonian forces thanks to the application of pressure on nearby front lines. But a more permanent solution needed to be achieved. Using FTL drives to bypass the space would immediately alert the Grats and lead us to be overrun with numbers before we have a fleet of our own. I've had my head engineers sent to a call with Owl to see if they could come up with anything. But if they didn't find a solution, shipments might be few and sparse. Let's see what else was on the list. Avalon, what's the status of our recent arrivals? The alien Dukchara has just had his evaluation completed. He was given a guest status. Why is he hesitating? And Dominique? Dominique is currently in the commercial district, at a bar. He did not attend his scheduled therapy. Captain Indrix Jayan, Gratonian Emergency Force. 
I would have gone insane in this cell if it weren't for an analog clock providing a promise of time still progressing. The rough concrete walls surrounding me were demoralizing, with the only detailing to break up the flat surfaces being patterned divots and a windowless metal sliding door. The dim orange glow emanating from a fixture embedded in the ceiling made seeing the far corners of the room a strenuous task, yet its inability to be shut off made sleeping an irritating endeavor. This stagnant melancholy was interrupted by the sounds of pneumatic pistons releasing compressed gas paired with the scraping of the metal door along its frame. I strained my eyes at the clock to see if I really had lost my grip on time. But it was still hours before my next scheduled meal was supposed to arrive. A mixture of relief and dread fought its way through me before settling down on restrained optimism that my situation would finally be seeing a development. A shorter, burly Grattonian man in a factory new guard outfit appeared on the other side of the doorframe. Meals would normally be delivered by a pair of guards as a redundancy measure, but this man was completely alone. He spoke in a deep, rough voice, and he was more focused on the path to his side than on me. Follow me. I couldn't think of a sound reason to refuse, nor could I see a positive result even if I had tried. Stepping out of the room was a jarring reminder of just how bleak this complex was. One side of the hall was lined with identical metal doors and their respective access terminals jutting out of the drab concrete. On the other side was a head-high metal pipe fence, intermittently spaced with massive square pillars. Looking down through the fence, I saw rows upon rows of halls, just like this one on the wall across the wide gap. I couldn't lean forward enough past the fence to see the end of this array, but I had the feeling that the sparse, weak, yellow-white lights would give the illusion of an endless abyss. This prison complex, which had been created by excavating the inside of an asteroid that had been caught in a solar orbit, was the largest prison in this sector of Gretonian territory. The guard led me into a gap in the concrete and onto an elevator. He slotted a key into one of the keyholes on the control panel and pressed floor buttons in a specific order, causing a ping to sound out as we started moving up. He stood to the side with his hands behind his back, looking straight forward to the wall across. Don't bother memorizing the code. It changes. A few tense minutes passed before we reached our destination. The elevator doors opened up into a short hallway with a single wooden door at the end. The guard opened it and gestured for me to step through before closing it behind me without following in. This room was a complete change of pace compared to the rest of the complex. The walls were lined with wood paneling, and it was pleasantly warm compared to the frigid air filling the numerous chasms of containment cells. There was a Grattonian woman on one end of the room covered in draping purple robes with moderate gold trims. The singular light overhead paired with the hood over her head cast a veil of shadow on her face, loosely concealing her identity. The horns jutting from the top of her head displayed elegance in simplicity rather than brazen flaunting, a recent trend among the high nobility. She motioned to a cushioned chair in front of her identical to the one she was sitting on and uttered a command. Sit. She grabbed a paper folder from a small table next to her and flipped through a couple pages before speaking again. Indrix Jane, a captain of great renown, relegated to emergency response just to have everything usurped, and then being jailed for taking action when others would not. It's a shame, that which came to pass. She looked up from her folder and straight at me. I could see the subtle reflection of her eyes, those beads of cruelty and hunger shared by all of the nobility but I value a soldier that can think for themselves. Speak freely, Hendrix. We have a common goal, after all. That human, Dominique, caused quite a mess, hmm? He hit the old nobles where it really hurt, and now they don't feel all too infallible anymore. The whole ordeal landed me with quite the sum to circulate, and actually cleaning up that mess would give me the purchase I've been after. That's where you come in. Being a soldier in the Grattonian army meant that you subjected yourself to the games of the nobles. Nobody ever told you this until you were too deep in to leave. I've heard the stories about nobles climbing their way up by secretly creating a mess just to clean it up themselves. If such schemes were ever revealed after they rose to power, they could simply smother the traces using their position. It was no mystery that the lives of foot soldiers and citizens were equivalent to bugs in their eyes.
I wanted to take the easy path, to have blind faith in my orders and simply execute anything asked of me with no question. But my mind had questions that craved answers. You planned all of this? She leaned forward slightly, letting light shine onto the front of her face so that I could see her mouth. She had a thin smile of amusement on display. I simply capitalized on an opportunity. We had our eyes on that Mokango in the luxury prison long before humans showed up, and I just put the two together to see if any developments would sprout. Either way, the task is simple. I'm going to provide you with a fleet of ships, and you're going to clean up that human infestation. You were on track for Admiral anyway. Do you think you can manage? That last question of hers rang around in my head. I'd been consumed by that very question since the beginning of my imprisonment. Could I even manage to take him down given adequate firepower? The reality of the answer tormented me. That man, Dominique. He's nigh unkillable in a fight. He pulled apart hundreds of men during an encirclement. The engine detonation on the ship when I tried firing the precision beam? That wasn't a malfunction. It was an intentional attack by him. The same thing happened during the initial encounter when my ship's shields were shut off moments before. My tangent was cut short when I noticed the smirk on the noble's face. It sent chills down my back. What part of this could possibly be amusing for her, or is it some twisted enjoyment from watching my struggles? My... You are quite perceptive. She pulled a page from her folder and handed it to me. It was filled with ship logs from the time during the detonation, but they were... strange. Not anything someone would notice if they weren't looking for something, but there were anomalies among the logs. Some were slightly out of order in their complementary execution, or certain stretches of time had just gone missing. The humans are working with a sentient Indrix, Likely a young one considering the sloppy work, but a sentient nonetheless. You will be given access to our own sentient alongside the fleet. Try not to lose it, hmm?